Good evening, everybody. Welcome home. Thank you, Lyle. Lyle's in the back. If you were looking for him, where's Rosie? There's Rosie. Okay, she's not alone. She's surrounded. Bradley's with her and, and other friends. So good evening, everybody. Again, welcome home. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for joining us online if you are. Kyler, what's going on? Welcome. Didn't get to say hi to you. Yeah, can you play the piano like that? Oh, there's still time. Your brother teaches lessons, and so, uh, anyway, we're, I'm so glad to see you. So welcome to Tennessee. Yeah, just calling you out. So good evening. So glad you're here tonight. As you can see, we're in Revelation chapter 14, entitled, The Go Everlasting Gospel for, for Chuckleheads. You ever meet a chucklehead? Takes one to know one, I would say that. I found that to be true. This last week, I just got back. It was actually this morning when I got back by the time I got home, but was in uh, Idaho, so flew um, to Boise, Idaho, and was at Gem State Adventist Academy. From there, we drove about three hours up to the summer camp, which is Ida Haven, and the academy, the first, I guess it's the third week of school, they have all the students go up there, and they have a spiritual retreat for three days, and so I was the presenter speaker for that, and so we had a great time. It's a beautiful camp. I mean, the weather was amazing. The the sky there looks, I guess, more white there, but I mean, pretty much every day the sky was just completely blue. Got up to about 80, zero humidity. Uh, at night it was in the 40s, so you'd get up. I mean, even during the day, you could wear a sweatshirt and pants, or you could wear shorts and a t-shirt. It's just, it was really nice as far as the weather, and the people were great too. Uh, it's right there on a lake, beautiful lake. Um, and they have multiple ski boats. They have quite a, quite a water program there during the summer. Uh, here's some of the students and staff there doing an activity there on the lawn. And here's where we had worship. This was the amphitheater. The school has about 80 students. And so it was 80 students plus faculty, staff, and myself. And so the students were very interesting there. Um, there's a lot of things I could say. One of the interesting things was uh, the kids, I mean, they're normal high school kids, kind of 14 to 18 years old. And, you know, free time, they're doing all kinds of stuff. It was nine square. You ever played nine square with that little structure? And it's like volleyball, but nine square. It's, it's a fun game. So they played a lot of that. There was a full court basketball court outside. So the kid plays a lot of basketball. Here was the interesting thing, and actually confused the staff as well, is that they don't keep score. Like they're just not interested in keeping score, which is just interesting because... I mean, they have uh, sports teams there at the school. They play in some different Christian uh, leagues and stuff. So obviously their score kept there. But when they play with themselves, you know, they, amongst themselves, they just don't even keep score. And so the staff is like, why do you guys keep score? Like, well, we just don't even care. So if somebody scores, even if it's not their team, they're just as happy as if they had scored. It's, it's a very interesting dynamic that not only I was like, that's interesting, but the staff was like, yeah, we don't know why. They just don't even keep score. They don't care. They just want to play basketball. So, okay, great. And so we had worship there. Um, there was different groups. One, one of these groups, there's these four, five guys actually. And my friend who brought me out there, his name is Pastor Ever Perez. Uh, his sister is Elitis Perez. Everybody knows Elitis. Uh, she's married to Pablo Alvarez. And they have two boys, Noah and Eli Alvarez. If you know them, they're uh, within the uh, College Hill Academy system. Anyway, my friend Ever, we worked together in Pennsylvania. He was. Uh, the chaplain, pastor at Blue Mountain. I worked with him there. Anyway, so he brought me out. And so these five guys, he said, man, I said, those guys are hilarious. He goes, yeah, I call them the chuckleheads. I said, what, the chuckleheads? I said, what? I said, oh, you'll see. These guys are just like kind of the life of the party, and they're just kind of zany and crazy. They, they feel like they're bodybuilders. Um, so they'll be walking around, and I was like, what are you guys doing? We were just doing some push-ups. So I was like, oh, cool, cool. And so I kind of got to the place where I started to joke around with them. I was like, hey, guys, do you have any protein? They're like, just had 40 grams of whey peptide. I mean, like, and then I just like would see them, and I'd just be like, what are you guys doing? Like, just, just kind of flexing and stuff. And so I was like, hey, you want to do some push-ups? Yeah, yeah, how many want me to do? I was like, uh, 20. So <laughs> one of the guys gets down, he starts doing push-ups. By 10, he's just gassed. 
And I was like, oh, no, it's fine. I mean, that 10, 10, 10's good or whatever. And it's like, you always want to do some pull-ups. They had a pull-up bar out there, like, by the ski shack thing where they put all the skis and life jackets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I just did lats the other day, so I'm a little sore. I was like, oh, that's fine. Like, like one pull-up. So they're, like, really into bodybuilding, but they're totally not in shape at all. I mean, like, kind of, kind of flabby, even registering pretty high on the flabometer. I mean, like, you wouldn't even know, but, like, they're just happy. They're just good to go. Uh, one of them... Actually, two of them. Two of them are in the worship uh, team that was leading all the music. And so one of the classes they offer is in worship leadership. And so one of them is up there. He has an electric guitar. And he's, he's playing and leading. Another one's on a box drum. So he's there kind of keeping the rhythm. Uh, you should know the one on the guitar there, uh, one of the chuckleheads. Uh, he's not sure who his dad is. Just never has met. Not sure uh, who he is. It's like... These guys are just happy-go-lucky, but they've experienced life, right? It's been tough. So our last day together, which was yesterday, and I will tell you that whenever you're speaking, if you're doing a week of prayer, it's a science. It really is a science. Because certain things will happen on a certain days no matter where you're at. You mean Africa speaking, Australia speaking, New York, Idaho. When you're speaking to high school kids, there's certain things will happen every single time. So what always happens is the third day. So if I'm somewhere, I'm speaking, I mean, I could be trying, I can learn everybody's name. I can be like, I'm telling you, it's the third day that there's this major breakthrough where they're like, come sit with us and all this kind of stuff. It's, a, it's always the third day. Well, yesterday was the third day and we were ending. It wasn't like a full week of prayer. It was just three days spiritual retreat kind of thing. And so third day, and I mean, you just could tell. So my last chance, spoke four times, this is the last time to speak. And so I just told him, I said, hey, guys, listen, uh, we're going to jump into the message here. But I want to tell you, you know, speaking, looking at, you know, some of the chuckleheads. So there's one of the chuckleheads, the guitar guy. I'm like, dude, keep going. Don't stop. God's using you. Keep going. I didn't get into all the stuff, his past, his background, his history. No, we don't need to talk about that, but just keep going. Looked at the other chucklehead, the drum guy, like, keep going. Looked at another guy, man, I've never heard anybody. Trying to call him by name and just look at him and say, keep going. The Lord is calling you. The Lord has a plan for your life. And so we dug in, and we were doing the three angels' messages as experienced righteous by faith. You know, your typical high school stuff. Anyway, so we were doing that and speaking about that all week. And the Lord was very present, and that's the testimony I want to give. This is the text message I got from Pastor Ever uh, this morning. Here's what he said. God is doing amazing things. I haven't felt the Spirit of God so palpably as I did this week in a long time, is what it should say. It was awesome. And so I share that to share with you that in spite of a chucklehead, (laughs) God did amazing things. Because I've discovered that I'm actually just a chucklehead telling other people, chuckleheads about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Takes one to know one. And so at the end of our time yesterday, we made a call and 10 students made a decision to be baptized. So it was amazing. And we praise the Lord for that. Tonight we were in Revelation chapter 14, and it's exactly that, what we were speaking about all week there at Idahaven. Revelation chapter 14, beginning In verse 6, it says this, Then I saw another what? What was he doing? He was flying in the midst of heaven, having what? The everlasting gospel to do what? To preach to those who dwell on the earth. There in all caps, to every nation, misspelled right there, tribe, tongue, and what? People. So the everlasting gospel is brought from heaven. This is a heaven-sent gospel message. It has worldwide application and implications sent from heaven for everybody living on the earth. The message is the everlasting gospel, which is shared with those who dwell on the earth who are in nations, tribes, tongues, and peoples. Those, Those words right there are significant. That's why they're in all caps. You can't miss it tonight. Why is that significant? I never caught this before, but over the last week or two, I, I, I saw this. Like, wait a second. And, and I'll, I'll call time out here for a second, too, is that I, I want to keep, I started to write, a, like, a, a book on three angels' messages, and righteous by faith, but I was like, I just had to stop because I, I don't know it yet. The Lord just kind of keeps unfolding all these things, and I'm just amazed. And so this is one of those things. 
to every, the everlasting gospel to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Why is it significant? Because last week we were in Revelation chapter 13, and notice this. It says this in verse 7, and authority was given him over what? Every tribe, tongue, and nation. We talked about last, last week how, how different um, nations or kingdoms were being set up, political or religious uh, otherwise, both of them. But behind the scenes, taking a step back from those kingdoms or nations or political or religious structures, behind the scenes, we see that those systems are empowered by the dragon. He's the puppet master. He's the one pulling the strings. He's the one who's using these entities for his purposes. And so an authority was given him. So it might have been, it's a political or religious entity, but behind the scenes, authority is coming from the dragon. The dragon is Satan over every tribe, tongue, and nation. So everyone on earth is now under the authority, under the, the, the dictates, under uh, the ideas or what the enemy is trying to bring against them. You can't forget those words, the authority. Satan's behind the scenes, and those words are so key. But here's what's so amazing to me. Again, looking at these key words, we slide to some good news because that authority is broken. Watch this. Revelation chapter 5, it says this in verse 9. You, Jesus, have redeemed us to God, how? By your blood, out of the authority of what? Every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Authority is given, so over every tribe, tongue, and nation. The everlasting gospel literally is sent from the throne room of heaven to everyone who's trapped and stuck. The result is, is that a redeeming process has happened by the blood of the Lamb that affects everybody who's in a tribe, tongue, nation, and people. The result is this, verse 10, verse 10, and have made us. That word made is significant because whenever you're talking about Jesus, again, he doesn't ever cease being who he is. He's always creator, right? Or recreator. As a result of this, Jesus makes the people something they weren't before. He gives them a position they did not have before as kings. Remember what Jesus said? You will sit with me on my throne with me. Again, the leadership in heaven is different from, it's not this, it's this. And priests to our God. Giving us this spiritual leadership, this spiritual position that we didn't have before. And we shall reign on the earth. It's a work that the Lord does. We see the result of the preaching of the everlasting gospel. How does he do that? It's the everlasting gospel. Today we're going to look at four facts constituting or making up the gospel message. We begin with the first one. It says this, the birth of Jesus. So the message to those who are stuck in a nation, tribe, or tongue is the everlasting gospel. Here are four things that make up that everlasting gospel. Number one, the birth of Jesus. The birth of Jesus. Here's what it says there in Romans chapter 8, Verse 3, God did by sending his own son in the what? Likeness of sinful flesh. So Jesus comes and he is born. Now there's so many people who are so deep and theological and it's stuff that I have to read, read and reread and, and visit often because it's stuff that I often forget. When Jesus took on flesh, what flesh did he take? In other words, yes, that's what this verse tells us. In other words, he didn't come in the flesh that Adam had before the fall. He came in the flesh that all of us are born into. When we are naturally bent to do the wrong thing, to sin, we're inclined by a sinful nature to, to go away naturally from the Word of God, from the law of God, right? Jesus comes in that same sinful flesh. That's significant. I, I love that because it, it's even portrayed. Have you ever thought about it there with Jacob's ladder? You remember Jacob's ladder? Jacob's running from Esau. He lays down. He gets a stone for a pillow. Puts his head by the pillow. I've often thought when he put his head by the pillow that he actually didn't use it as a pillow. He put his head beside it. This is just my imagination. That when Esau would come and try to cut off his head, he'd hit the stone, right? 
could be he was very fearful. But in the night of his fear, the Lord sent the everlasting gospel to him. Right? He's there and he dreams and all of a sudden he sees this ladder, this staircase, and it goes all the way up to heaven and it reaches just almost to earth. No, it reaches all the way and rests on the earth because it's symbolic of Jesus himself. If Jesus came back in the, in the flesh of Adam pre-sin, it would be almost as if that ladder would stop short and it would be up here and say, all right, humanity, come up to me. If humanity could make it up even just one rung on our own, then we wouldn't need Jesus at all. The fact of the matter is we can't even make it up one rung. So the ladder comes all the way and rests to the earth. It's symbolic that Jesus would come in sinful flesh as Paul wrote about here in the book of Romans. He comes in the same flesh that you are born into. That's why we have a high priest who would sympathize with every weakness that you and I go through. Because he was born in the same condition as us. Now you say, wait a second, he's all the way God, he's all the way man, explain that. Not tonight. <laughs> that will be a study in heaven. Teaching points as we continue. Jesus comes in sinful flesh. Like the flesh we are born into. He comes to, this is good news, to save us right where we are. You don't have to backtrack to get to Jesus. I repeat myself. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. The goodness of God. We sing about that, or we're going to sing about that actually at the end. Jesus comes after us, and his hand is not shortened that it can't say, oh, you went too far, and I, I just, just out of my reach. That's not true. Jesus comes to us right where, we're, where we are. So wherever you're at tonight, watching tonight, here tonight, wherever you are, you are within the grasp of Jesus. You are within the reach of the shepherd. Jesus can take a hold of you and pull you close wherever, but I've got to work, the, I know, I've got stuff that I've got to work out first. The first thing you need to work out is say yes to Jesus. Because you will be powerless to step aside from whatever it is apart from Christ. It's just like that sheep stuck in the thicket. Jesus is say, come on, no, you're stuck in the thicket. Jesus is, gonna, is the one who has to release what has been stuck in a thicket or a tribe or a tongue or a people. It's the everlasting gospel. He comes to save us right where you, I, they are. Number two, the life of Jesus. Number one, it was the birth of Jesus. What constitute the everlasting gospel? This, this good news for chuckleheads? So the birth of Jesus, now the life of Jesus. Teaching point, first one here is Jesus is holy and lived his life in sinful flesh. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I love this. His presence in sinful flesh overcame it. So what made the difference within sinful flesh? The presence of a holy God. Is that applicable? The answer is yes. <laughs> it's very applicable. Because is anybody here born in sinful flesh? Can I get a witness tonight? Thank you. We are born in sinful flesh, but what makes the difference for sinful flesh when there's a holy presence that lives inside of it? Whoo! Isn't this awesome? To think about it, Jesus is born in sinful flesh. Well, then how did he do it? A holy presence lived in sinful flesh. Okay, so, so how do I do it? Because I'm sinful. A holy presence lives in sinful flesh. That is how, is how it works. Paul says this, to Colossians, it is Christ in you. That is, I supplied those words, the hope that we all have. The hope for those born in sinful flesh is Christ living inside of you. Think of that temple motif that we, we've read about, we've learned about, that temple in the wilderness, then there in Jerusalem, the Shekinah glory. What made that temple so special because of all the gold? No, sir. No, ma'am. It was the presence of a holy God that made it special. It is Christ living in the soul temple. That is your hope tonight. That is my hope tonight. If we're going to experience the glory, right, the, the end of the story, it's going to be because of this. Christ 
living inside of you and me. Maybe, just maybe within this context, this verse has more significance. Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door of what? Your heart, your life. Again, wherever you are at, the ladder comes down right there. Jesus shows up wherever you are, and he knocks. If anyone hears my voice and does what? Our first work every single day should be to fall upon our knees and say, Lord, here's the door, and it is open. Come on in, and then I'm going to deadbolt it. Can you empower that, Lord? Because I want you in. Please never go out. Behold, I stand at the door. Why does he stand at the door and knock? Because all of us, our only hope of glory is Christ in us. What happened in the sinful flesh that Christ was born in, what made it the difference is a holy presence residing in it. That life lived in that sinful flesh is to be redone or, or to happen again in your flesh and in mine. As a holy presence, Jesus lives inside of us. The facts about Jesus may be familiar. The problem is when they're not experiential, when we haven't experienced this for ourselves. Many look at Jesus from afar, knowing the facts. Yep, I know about his birth. I know about his death. I know how long he lived. I know where he was born. I know he went and lived in Egypt for a while. I know all the stuff. But cannot, like the woman at the well, say, he told me everything I ever did. I mean, she had an experience, didn't she? She had an experience so much, so much with Jesus that she ran back to town forgetting her water pot. Didn't, the, life, stuff that mattered didn't matter as much anymore. She ran back to town. She got on a table maybe and she said, everybody, you've got to come and meet this guy. She had a personal experience. She had heard about the Messiah. They started going back theologically about stuff here, worshiping that mountain, that mountain. But she went back and said, everybody, could this be the one? Because I have had an experience. Have you had an experience with Jesus? An experience where he does for you that which you could never, ever, ever do for yourself. As a result of him living in the soul temple. That he does a cleansing that you couldn't. That he does a changing that you couldn't. What's sticking with me uh, from last week is when we were in Zechariah chapter 3. Within this context. If you remember, Joshua, high priest, was clothed with, how was he clothed? Filthy garments. What does that represent? Yeah, sinful flat. I mean, he's just, he's broken. He was standing before the angel, capital A, the presence of Christ. That's an interesting thing. Think about that. Us just standing there as we are, and there's Jesus. Then he answered, And spoke to those who stood by him, saying, take away the filthy garments from him. This is the part I can't get away from. Again, it's just, I mean, I've read this, I knew this, but it's just coming back to me all week long. Take away the filthy garments from him. When Jesus comes to live in your soul temple, he simply doesn't just cover up our sin. He takes it away. That's the experience. When we have a testimony, I'm telling you, I was... But Jesus took it away. How? I'm telling you, my only hope for a chocolate, he was living inside of me. He didn't. I couldn't. Take away the filthy garments. He doesn't save us in our sins. He saves us from our sins, right? That, he takes away our filthy garments. He takes away the thing that I can't change in and of myself. Jesus does it at his word. And there was a change in the life of Joshua. And he said to... And to him he said, see, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. The sin is removed, and he's clothed with rich robes, which represent righteousness. You know, oftentimes I thought, you know, the Lord just comes, and he places his righteousness over the sin in my life. And and maybe on some level that's... But I think the power of the gospel is is saying, wait a second. Jesus didn't just say, hey, we're just going to take care of that when you get to heaven. Jesus says, I'm going to do a work in your life that's going to bring so much glory to me, that's going to inspire somebody else to say, hey, how did you do that? I'm telling you, I didn't do it. I'm, I'm Captain Chucklehead. I'm telling you, it was not me. It was the power of a living God. 
And what he does is, is he's willing to live inside of us. And he works from the inside out. As Jesus went and cleansed that temple in Jerusalem, he does the same thing. And he's passionate and he's on fire to get Satan's footholds out of the way. So often we, th- we think of a, the wrath of Christ coming against us. Have you thought about the wrath of Christ coming against the devil who has tried to keep us under his authority in a tribe, nation, tongue, or people? He's a passionate God who says, get away from my family. Leave them alone. The Lord rebuke you, enemy. He clothes us with his righteousness. And they put the clothes on him. There's righteousness that covers him. And the angel of the Lord stood by. Jesus is right there. Could it be even in a a symbolic sense, Jesus is living inside of him. And then the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua or told him, thus says the Lord of hosts, If you walk in my ways, and if you will keep my commandments. Anyway, I just find this super interesting that he didn't start out with Joshua and come up to him and say, Hey, Joshua, start living differently. There's a command to live differently after the Lord has done a work in his life. You cannot keep the commandments until you've been given the commandments. We don't have the power. There's going to be disappointment and discouragement if you just say, All right, I'm going to do this on my own because we will fall short. But if righteousness has been put inside of us... Jesus has recreated us. He has freed us from the authority of the enemy. And all of a sudden, we walk in a way we couldn't walk before. We keep what we could not keep before. As we've talked about a gazillion times in Ezekiel chapter 36, just in those 15 verses, 21 times, the Lord says, I will. I will. By the way, I will. When it comes to that, I will. 21 times 15 verses, and he says, as a result of everything I'm going to do in you, you're going to walk in a way you couldn't before and keep what you couldn't keep before, only by the power of Jesus. You remember what Paul said in Romans 7, he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me or save me from this body of death? Remember, we're born bent towards sin with a sinful nature, but he says, aha, I thank God it is through Jesus Christ Christ our Lord. Paul, how did you do it? It's Christ who lives in me. That's how it happens. Every single day, I die to self. I get into his presence. And you know what it says there, that nobody, a sinful being or sin cannot reside in the presence of a holy God. It's consumed. So what happens? I've got to get into his presence because in his presence, self is crucified. Self is killed. And then I invite Jesus to come in. Come in and live inside of me. Number one was the birth of Jesus. Number two was the life of Jesus. Number three is the death of Jesus. These four things that constitute the everlasting gospel that comes to a people who are stuck. The death of Jesus, it says this, Jesus came to fulfill the death sentence and make a way of what? Escape for humanity. Where there is sin, there must be death. Jesus comes to fulfill the death sentence for all of us. Uh, as all sinned in Adam and were condemned to die, so what happened? Adam sinned. From that moment forward, all of a sudden, there's this perf- he's perfect with a, a perfect nature, but he, he sins and his nature is broken. And as Eve and him have children, they are born with sin as a result of Adam's sin. As all sinned in Adam and were condemned to die, all died then with Jesus because Jesus comes as the second Adam. The word Adam in Hebrew means man. He comes as the second man, capital M. As all were condemned to die in the first man, all were uh, declared righteous to live forever with the second man. All died with Jesus on the cross and were delivered. We find some Bible verses that back this up. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, as just as through one man sin entered the world, that's Adam, and death through, through sin, and thus death spread, ah, like a virus to all men because all sinned. Adam sins, and all of a sudden it's just everyone. The authority, we're, we're trapped. But verse 18 says this, through one man's offense, judgment came to all men. That's true. Even so, through one man's righteous act. What was his righteous act? Yeah, at the cross, right? Jesus gives away his life through one man's righteous act, the free gift. Not the gift earned, not the gift given to some, not the gift that say, you know what, the, the more spiritual, right where we are at, the free gift came to all men, all humanity. 
everybody the free gift because the penalty had been paid. Jesus took our place as the second Adam. Teaching points. When Jesus died on the cross, all of a sudden, the first death was made a sleep. We don't have to fear the first death anymore. When we die, we sleep in Christ. The penalty has been paid. Stay with me. Because the second death was executed on the cross. The second death as a, as a penalty for sin was executed at the cross. That why, that's why when Paul says, don't sorrow like everyone else's sorrows. When somebody passes away, you can comfort them because the first death is simply asleep. The second death has been executed. The penalty that was due, all of us, has been paid in full. Jesus didn't come to pay it some. He paid it all. The second death was executed on the cross. The consuming fire that is coming is not for us. It's not for a human being. It is prepared, Jesus said, for the devil and his angels. The second death, when hellfire comes to consume, it's reserved exclusively for the devil and his angels. However, the devil or the dragon is doing everything he can to take as many people with him. Because this free gift has been given to everybody. You've heard me say it before. I appreciate it. It makes a lot of sense to me. What Philip Yancey says, the, the, the only requirement to receive a free gift is an open hand. Could it be an open heart? an open door to your heart where you put faith in the fact when you say, Jesus died in your place. He loves you. When we come to a place where we say, wait a second, I recognize that, that I, I am a sinner. We yield, we confess, we repent, and we put our faith exclusively in Jesus. That gift applies to me. It's made true in my life. It's already true, but it's made true in my life, in your life. That fire is reserved only for the devil and his angels. And those who will be consumed with that are those who are clinging to self and to sin as opposed to clinging to Christ. Nobody need be consumed in that fire. Only the devil and his angels. Because a second death was executed on the cross. Number four, the resurrection of Jesus. It was the birth of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus is the guarantee that new life is available to every believer in Jesus. New life is available to everybody. Notice what it says in 2 Corinthians. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, Paul's favorite phrase, in Christ, Christ in you. If anyone is in Christ, is Christ is living in you. He is a new. She is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If the creator is living inside of you, you are a new creature. Having been created, being recreated, and in the future will be recreated. That's actually how uh, Sequera put it in something I read today. If anyone is in Christ, they, he or she, is a new creature creation. In other words, if you and I open that door, new things are available to you. You know what? I just can't get past this. You know what? I'm struggling with this. I'm not saying we're not ever going to, Lord, just come in and just take every struggle away from us. Of course, Paul, thorn in the flesh, there was this thing. We don't know what it was. Why don't we know what it was? Most likely, so that we could all say, oh, I can, it's a kind of a fill in the blank there. I can put my struggle there and it will make sense for me too. His experience can be applicable to my experience. But the truth of the matter is, new is available to all of us. Jesus says, follow me and I will make you. He promises to bring new in your life. And that only kind of means something if you say, I need new stuff in my life. For me, that's most clear when I look to the cross. Because when I look to the cross, again, I say, you know what? I'm not like him. When I'm struggling, the last thing I want to do is be comforting other people. But Jesus, what is, Father, you know, don't, don't, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. You know what it is when he gets up there and all of a sudden he cries out and he's praying, Father, forgive them. They don't know. They don't get it. They don't know what they're doing. He's forgiving the people who are literally killing him. The cross reveals that I'm not like him unless he does something new in my life. Lord, I need you to put newness in me, to recreate me, to look just like you. 
we come to the second verse that we're going to look at tonight, Revelation chapter 14, verse, verse 7, and here's what it says. Saying with a loud voice, verse 7, Worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. Okay. So worship Him who made all these things. It's interesting because those words come specifically from the Old Testament, specifically several verses, but this is one of them. Exodus chapter 20, it says this, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Some of you are saying, wait, 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 time out. We were doing so well. We were focusing on the gospel. We were, the, all this, and all of a sudden we went to the Sabbath. You know what, you're Chris, you're a Seventh-day Adventist. You always got to come back to the Sabbath. I'm telling you, it's right here in the midst of this. And for me, it is so not only pertinent, but it's so powerful in the midst of the gospel. Just bear with me. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Fourth commandment going on, verse 11. For in six days, who? The Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. So it's interesting, in, as this message comes from the throne room of heaven, of the everlasting gospel to those who are in a tribe or tongue or a people, All of a sudden, there is this clear allusion or pointing to the Sabbath. Why? Why is the Sabbath highlighted here in the midst of this first angel's message? Another question would be, why does the devil or the dragon work so hard to eliminate the Sabbath and create his own counterfeit in last week's Revelation 13 and this here in Revelation chapter 14? Why does he work so hard? To push aside, take focus off of God's Sabbath and make his own counterfeit. And, and why, do, why does he work so hard? What's his angle here? What's he trying to accomplish? Well, teaching point here would be the Sabbath reminds us of his power to create and recreate from how much? From nothing. Do you remember what it said in Revelation chapter 5 there? He's made us to be kings and priests. He's made me what I wasn't. I tried my hardest. I couldn't get past it. I couldn't get free. I wanted to be better. I wanted to be more spiritual. I wanted to be, but I couldn't. It was the creator who made me what I wasn't. Into it only he could make me. The Sabbath reminds us of his power. He's the only one who has the power to create. And then for those of us who are born in sinful flesh, recreate us. Even when we bring absolutely nothing to the table. Isn't that good news? You know what? I need you to, to, to get it together first. Bring this to the table. No, 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 no. Jesus says, I will come in and eat with you and you with me. Revelation 3, verse 20. He didn't say bring something to the table. He says, you, you make the decision to open the door. I'm coming in and I will set the table too. Ezekiel chapter 20. I love this verse. Verse 12 says, moreover, I gave them my Sabbath to be a, a sign between them and me. What, what kind of sign? That they might know that I am the Lord God who does what? Sanctifies, in other words, changes them. Remakes them. The Sabbath is a tool given to us by God to remind, to remind, to teach, to keep us focused on. Wait a second. If there's going to be newness in my life, it's going to be Jesus living in this soul temple. He's the one who's going to have to remake me and do something in me to change me says this, this is the design of the Sabbath, to bring man to a saving knowledge of God. Do I need to say it? I guess I do, because many of us here are Seventh-day Adventists. The Sabbath does not save you. It doesn't get you to heaven. You don't get points. You don't bring things to the table. You don't bring, you know, I have a level of righteousness. Remember, the ladder comes all the way down to the ground because we can't even get up one rung of that ladder. The Sabbath is this gift given to us by God to remind us that it is Him and Him alone. The weekly pause in time is to bring us point blank, face to face, with the everlasting gospel. Have you thought of the Sabbath that way? To bring us face to face with the everlasting gospel that Jesus came in sinful flesh. That Jesus' life, it was his holy presence in sinful flesh that made the difference. His death on the cross, he took my place and he executed the second death. He made the first death asleep. Did we get to the fourth one already? No, we didn't. What happens when you write the sermon the same day? (laughs) 
Revelation chapter 5, verse 3 says this, and no one in heaven and earth or under the earth was able. So can we just reiterate? Can we just, can we admit and we come to a place that we just can't? You just can't. I stop there because it says other things, but that says, I mean, I don't think it changes the meaning of the verses by just stopping there. No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth, nobody could do anything. It's true because what did Jesus say? John chapter 15, verse 5, with mouth me, you can do absolutely nothing. So no one was able. Powerless would be another way to say it. Verse 4, John all of a sudden starts to just cry. He loses it. He said, I wept much because no one was found worthy. No one could do anything about it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep, John. John, it's okay. John, behold. This is like John the Baptist, right? Saying, look at him. Behold, the lamb or the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has what? Prevailed. He has done what nobody in heaven and earth could do. He did it, and he did it alone. And I looked, and behold, in the midst stood a lamb as though it had been slain. Who is this? It is Jesus. It is Jesus who has died in place of humanity. It is Jesus who has made a way. It is Jesus who is resurrected and is victorious. It is Jesus who is right smack dab in the middle, the one who makes a difference. And then there's a response as, as the, been pointed to Jesus as the one who's prevailed, the line of the tribe of Judah. You have redeemed us to God. How? By your blood. It was through the cross out of every tribe. All oh, authority was given. We were stuck. The enemy had a great plan. The enemy was really strong. I was really weak. I couldn't do anything about it. But you did something. You purchased me with your blood. Payment has already been made for every single human being that's ever lived. That's the good news that we have to run around and tell everybody, no, no, you don't understand. It's already been done. He's already paid the price. Well, I'm not sure I'm worth it. Well, I don't care what you think. He does. And he was willing to spend everything on you. Like what? His life. He has spent everything on you. You have been redeemed. If we will yield to that fact, as the light shines from the cross, it becomes true for us as we open our hearts and say, I put faith in this one. Could this be the woman at the well? Could this be the Christ? As she experiences the power of him for herself. By his blood, out of every tribe, get out of the way. The Lord rebuke you, enemy. You thought you had him in a tribe. You thought you had him in a tongue. You thought you had the people. You thought you had a nation. But there was a redeemer who prevailed. There was one who was stronger, not only in passion, but in ability, who came and redeemed his people and made them what they weren't before, kings and priests to God. And there's an eternity factor here. And we shall reign on the earth with him forever. That's the new earth. When he comes back and makes everything new. I love this song. It says many men, many humanity, men, women, many people will drink the rain and turn and thank the cloud. Many men will hear a voice behind them and will never turn around. The Creator God put this thing in place, the Sabbath, yes, to get in the way of everything else, to cause us to stop and say, wait a second, I, I'm, not, I'm not thanking a cloud, I'm not thanking how hard I worked, I'm thanking the Creator who did everything for me. When the voice of the Spirit of God calls me, that nothing else would get in the way, but that I would yield and turn to hear what He has to say to me. I'm wondering if he's saying anything to you tonight. Because whatever he's saying, again, whenever you hear the Spirit of God, that is the time to respond. Now, a little bit later, maybe a better time. No, right now. If Jesus is telling you to do something, whatever it is, do it. You say, well, you have any suggestions? Uh, yeah, I have a few. Number one, make a decision to say, Lord, I want you to come in. What makes the difference in sinful flesh? The holy presence of Christ. The other thing is, you've been redeemed. Have you put your faith exclusively in Christ? That he died for you. He has a place set up for you. 
I mean, I, I, I guess this is a thing. Could it be? I mean, Jesus knows everything to end from the beginning. So I, but could it be that he's making a place for everybody? Could it be that there's going to be mansions in heaven that are empty of people who decided not to fill them? But Jesus is making a place for all of us. And he's calling us to put his faith, not in us, not in our ability, not in a church, not in a pastor, not in, you know what, I've, I'm, I'm a lot better, exclusively in him. I'm going to invite Caleb to come up and lead us in a song. If we could stand for this song. And I wonder, I'm just going to kneel here. You don't have to. But if there's something the Lord's telling you to do and you want to respond to that, and this is part of the symbolic act of just saying, yes, you can come kneel with me. You stay where you're at if you'd like. But we're going to sing about how good God is because our Father in heaven loves us too. And he sent his son to give his life away for one purpose, to get his family home. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. In all my days, I've been held in your hand. Moment that I wake up until I lay my head, and I will see of the goodness of God. And all my life, you have been faithful, and all my life, you have been so, so. every breath that I am able, yes, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire and darkest night, and you are close like no other known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful, and all my life you have been so, so With every breath that I am able, yes, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so With every breath that I am able, yes, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Because your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it keeps running after me. With my life laid down. Surrender now and give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid now. Surrender now and give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it keeps running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been 
so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God all my life. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my so, so good, God. With every breath that I am able, oh God, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Yes, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Yes, I'm going to sing of the goodness of you God. Amen and amen. All the chuckleheads said, amen. Father in heaven, you are so good to us. You come running after us. What a, what a word picture. So Father, today or tonight, we are so grateful for a Savior. Thank you for taking our place on the cross. Thank you for wanting to come and live inside of us. Thank you that you're willing to apply your power in our lives to recreate us and take things out of our lives that we can't even budge. Lord, we're standing, we're kneeling before you, and we want to say yes to everything you want to do in us. Lord, I pray you give us the strength to hold nothing back. Take us 100%. Do in us that which you want to do. Recreate us. Lord, we know you're the same creator from Eden. You, you breathed into Adam and Eve. You made them what they were. Lord, would you do that in us tonight? We're praying for the indwelling Christ. And then use us, Lord. Shine out of us to encourage somebody else. How did you do it? Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. He's the Christ. We love you. We can't wait to come and get us. I pray over my friends who came forward. Whatever it is you're asking them to do, Lord, I praise you as they fall before you, as they say yes, and just say, Lord, give power to that decision. In Jesus' name, let everyone say amen and amen. Please be seated. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We have some food if you'd like to eat. Um, we have a couple of announcements. The first one is by Lynn. I invite her to come up, and she's going to share. Can I give her uh, Caleb's microphone? Thank you, oh. Pastor Chris. How many of you have a child or a family member or somebody close to you that is heavy on your heart that you pray for a lot? Um, I certainly do. And um, several of us um, got together and we said, we want to pray, but not just individually, we want to pray corporately. And so this coming Sunday, between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., um, we're going to be meeting at Jesus for Asia headquarters. They have willingly opened up their doors, so we're, they won't be there, but we're going to be using their facility to pray. It's come and go. You don't have to stay for the whole four hours. You could come even just for one prayer and leave. Um, and you don't have to remember that because I'm going to give you a paper that has that written down. So you can put that on your fridge. And that is the beginning of Sunday Prayer Sunday. We can call it Soul for Souls Prayer Sunday. And we have a list here of every Sunday there's an opportunity to pray with other people for different ministries. For this ministry, we do that at the end of the month. Um, for our city in particular. Um, for Serenity. Is it Serenity Point? Um, the house that um, has all those girls who are near Brainerd School. And so um, I'll be passing these out. Please put this on your fridge. Pray about it. Maybe you want to come out a couple of times. Thank you.
prayer coordinator, and so thank you, Lynn, for doing that. So 10 a.m., uh, Jesus for Asia there on Udo Ringgold Road right next to the Lantern, right? Also known as Morning Point. Thank you so much. Um, so anyway, uh, thank you for being here tonight. We really don't have any other announcements that I can remember right now. And so there's food. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us online. We're so glad you're here. We hope and pray that you will join us on Wednesday night for an hour, 45 minutes, of power in prayer uh, this Wednesday night just in the youth room down the way. You park in the a parking lot on the other side. But it's an awesome time, 45 minutes, as we pray for each other. We pray over names and we ask the Lord to pour out His Holy Spirit that the mission the Lord has given us would be accomplished. So we hope you can join us uh, for those 45 minutes uh, as we seek the Lord to do all the stuff He wants to do. But thank you for being here tonight. We love having you here. And so you're welcome to go and eat. <laughs>